Our people, our clothes. We need to get a new building. All right. Thanks for coming, everyone. As you continue to eat your food and find a seat, we're going to go ahead and get started. I'm very excited. We have Rich Swanson here tonight. Um, he is a PhD student from the University of Colorado, but he's here at MIT, just upstairs. Um, we can find him all the time. And he's also the president of a cool NGO called World Partners. So if you have questions about that, I'm sure we can talk about it later. Um, but first, he's going to talk to us about the Grand Inga project, which, if you're not familiar with it, is this huge um, hydro project in Africa that people have been talking about for years. Um, so we're just going to let us know what's really happening with Inga and what could happen in the future. Yeah, thanks, Amy. So, uh, so Amy and I work together on uh, project called Africa's Energy Futures, which is um, sponsored by uh, a group that has a big name, but I think it's a pretty small group at the, at the UN called the World Institute of Development Economics Research. And so they're sponsoring this project, which is a little bit of an eclectic gathering of different research components. So Amy's doing some um, supply side energy modeling. Uh, and Somebody else is doing some research on, a, on, on a sort of spatial scaling of, um, uh, of, I guess it's a water, it's a, it's a water inputs and, and for, for basin analysis and, and hydropower output. Um, some other people are doing uh, wind and solar <coughs> modeling, and my part is to uh, develop a real options application to big hydropower projects like the Inga Dam and a couple others in Africa. And so that's how I got started with this Inga thing. Um, and I haven't, uh, I don't know, Ignacio, you may have been to the site. I've never, I've never been to the site. I've never even been to DRC. Um, but uh, the, the Inga Dam, as Amy said, has been on the minds of people for you know the better part of a century, if not longer. And it sort of is this big project that's out there that could do an awful lot to uh, supply power to Africa, but um, it still seems like it's a little ways off. So uh, we'll take a look at it um, just in sort of a very 30,000 foot level uh, tonight. And you can stop me if you want to and ask questions, or um, you can ask any of them at the end. I don't think this is a super long presentation, so we'll see. So the Inga Dam is located near the town of Inga in the Democratic Republic of China, relatively close to the mouth of the uh, Democratic Republic of Congo. Um, on, the, on the Congo, it's a relatively close to the mouth of the Congo River. Um, the facility, if constructed, would be the largest hydropower plant in the world, uh, some 39,000 megawatts of electricity. It would, could be one of, the, I mean, cer certainly would be one of the biggest civil works projects ever attempted. Um, the power from it, like I said, could electrify a lot of Africa. Um, but it seems like completion of it or even the, the start of the next phases is still a distant possibility at best. So we want to take a look at some of the following questions, uh, or, or all the following questions in varying level of detail. First of all, a little bit about the history of the site. Why has Inga not been built? Uh, this huge power source sitting on the, on the Congo River. Uh, why has it not been built? Today there's some renewed interest, and we want to take a look at where that interest is coming from and what are some of the new ideas that have been driving a little bit of uh, uh, renewed interest in the dam. So the history, uh, back in the 50s and 60s, and even before that, um, Belgian engineers went down in uh, the early 1900s, discovered this site as being a place where there was vast amounts of hydropower uh, potential and started drawing up uh, plans and ideas for construction. In the 50s and 60s, they began, the Belgian government began planning a facility um, as that area was uh, colonized. And it, the construction and everything was interrupted by wars for independence and eventually a coup um, that placed Mobutu in power. He uh, started developing it in the 60s um, and the 70s, and then finally construction began on what's called Inga One, 
Um, this is a picture of Inga Falls, by the way, gives you a little bit of an idea of the cascades and the, the vertical fall there from um, that section of the river. But, but he started construction in, I think, the late 60s and completed Inga 1 in 1972, financed by uh, the country. So, I just to jump in. so the picture you just showed us is where they considered putting Inga 3? This is, I, I don't know if that's precisely it, but that's illustrative of just the, the, uh, the falls. And I can't, I, I think maybe later on in here I have the total vertical um, head that would be available. Um, but there's just a, a lot of water uh, coming through this area. And the way that they've designed it is, you know, to sort of maximize this, this huge area. So whether or not they would put it right there, you can. I don't know if you can see, but way over here on the left, there's people standing there. Uh, they're kind of dwarfed by the falls, but uh, I think there's some aspect of it that's a tourist area as well. So they completed Inga One. Um, it's a six turbine plant. It generated at its opening 351 megawatts. It mostly went to Kinshasa, um, populated areas nearby. Inga 2 was a second year dam con uh, completed 10 years later. Um, it supplied about 1,400 megawatts, was an eight turbine plant. And that power went mainly to the south of the country, um, to uh, Katanga, I think it's called. There's a bunch of copper mines down the south of, of the DRC. And they wanted to uh, buy the power, so they shipped it down there. Both facilities were owned and operated by the National Power Company. Um, so, the whole project ran into some problems. Um, first of all, they needed a 1,700 kilometer line to bring the power down to the south. And that got very expensive um, for a lot of reasons. There were the, the Shaba mines, which were the copper mines that I mentioned down the south. The, the, there was an uh, ethnic group in the South that also wanted independence from the DRC that was causing all sorts of problems. So the government was interested in delivering the power because they could, plan, you know, they could get some revenues from it, but they also wanted to placate uh, or you know, sort of extend power to this group in the South. Um, the West was very interested in getting their money back because they had been involved in some of the loans for the project, especially the transmission lines. And they had this agenda that Congo remained anti-communist. So all these things, uh, competing agendas and different corruption, you know, sort of entry points, drove the cost of the project uh, to about $500 million over their intended budget. By the 1980s, the cost of the transmission line alone was 24% of Congo's national debt. And Congo, in 1999, still owed the US uh, and, uh, or the, uh, the Export-Import Bank over $900 million. So there was, a, there was just a lot of money um, that had been sunk in, especially after the uh, transmission lines went in. Now, actually, the, the World Bank has just stepped in to sort of refurbish, but just prior to that, the dams were operating at about 40% of capacity, or about 700 megawatts uh, combined you, between you, the two. Do you remember what voltage the line was? Because a the CFAP project in Central America is 1,800 kilometers, and the cost was less than $500 million. And that one, the remaining cost is 900. Well, I think a lot of that was probably interest. That was probably interest payments over the, you know, over many years, and um, possibly even repairs that, you know, that came in. Yeah. Um, by the way, m most of the information from this is from a feasibility study um, that I can s give to Amy. That's super interesting. It's even more interesting if you speak French, which I don't. But you can, you know, you can translate different aspects of it, and it's a. Uh, it's a really good feasibility study that was recently completed. It's 220 kilovolts. That line? That's the line that connects the DRC to other countries. Sorry. So, beginning in 2002, the World Bank started leading efforts to rehabilitate the DRC's overall electricity grid, and the Inga site was a big part of it. 
Um, so they began dredging behind the dam. Um, they started repairing the transmission lines. Uh, the transmission lines had been, some of them had been, um, people had been taking metal off of the towers and the towers were breaking down and uh, stuff like that. Really the interest was new supply. They wanted to, the World Bank still does, uh, want to generate obviously more electricity for Africa. Um, but these sites were, were part of it. Um, in 2013, three out of the six turbines at Inga, one had been rehabilitated, one had been replaced. Um, at Inga 2, about five turbines are working. The other three are to be refurbished by the end of this year. Um, that was, according to World Bank documents, uh, supposed to cost about <coughs> $100 million. Um, according to International Rivers, which may be augmenting the figure slightly, the rehabilitation project overall for the Inga 1 and 2 site was $1.2 billion over the last 10 years. So what, is the, what is International Rivers? Are they yeah, so they're, they're, they're opposed to uh, the construction of dams. Um, so they have, they have an interesting website, you can get a lot of information from there, um, but I always sort of feel like I should qualify the, at least the numerical estimates. Um, they're, they're very involved actually in lobbying U.S. Congress not to ever invest in a dam anywhere. Um, so through any kind of disbursement, um, I'm interested. So Inga 3 and Grand Inga would be the next phases of the, of the Inga Dam. Um, they would represent a series of standalone projects, bringing the total capacity of the site to about 39,000 megawatts. There would be 52 power generators, each with about 750 megawatts of capacity. <coughs> Um, it would also be, the, the site would also be highly cost effective if they could get over the hump of the initial um, construction costs, delivering energy at about two cents per kilowatt hour. Inga 3, and I'll get into a little bit of the phases that they're talking about building, but Inga 3 would be a 205 two meter head dam, which is high, big. Can you give us like a like another dam that we might know? Like three gorges. Yeah, how big is three gorges? Dam. Three gorges about twenty uh, twenty two thousand five hundred megawatts. Right. Um, how high is it? Um, it was It's not exactly very high. Um, I think it's less, less than a hundred meters in height. And all this power just because it's, it's so wide, and so there's so many exactly. so many turbines, right? Right. right. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I don't know, I think my house is about 30 feet tall. It's a little two-story house, so seven times that. <laughs> no, 20, 20 sometimes that. Or 20, that's right, that's right, yeah, 20 feet, yeah, you're right. Um, yeah, so it's, a, I mean, it'd be a massive structure. Uh, the demand is really driven by South Africa primarily. Um, they're interested in, um, in purchasing uh, a lot of the power from at least this first phase of Inga. Um, the, uh, I think the total country demand, somebody else might know more accurately than me, but is around 40,000 megawatts in South Africa. But they have continual brownouts now that are, that are rolling uh, most of the time. Well, at least in the, in the, uh, you know, the, the peak demand times. Um, there would be a transmission line that would be required, about 3,000 uh, kilometers through uh, Zambia and Namibia. So that would obviously add significant, you know, significantly to the cost. Um, a little bit about the river and flows. The Congo River is the second largest river in the world by watershed, 3.7 million square kilometers. The DRC is estimated to have a hydropower potential of 100,000, that should say, or 100 gigawatts, is that right? Mm -hmm. Am I big numbers right? Yeah, 100 gigawatts. Um, and that would be tapping into hydropower all up and down the Congo River. The river's basin receives um, a, a year-round rainfall, so there's a real small variance in river flows, which makes it interesting from a climate change or a flood drought perspective, 
Um, at Inga particularly, you get very consistent flows, um, which is a real benefit. Flows average about 40,000 cubic meters per second, and the standard deviation relative to that is pretty small. So a little bit about the design. Um, it was initially conceived as one big arch dam. Um, now it's been broken into five to eight phases, depending on how you would sort of slice it up. Phases A to C would cost about $12 billion just for the dam alone. And the way that they would do it, or at least the way that one proposal says to do it, is to first build a low dam of 150 meters, plus a spillway off to the side. The spillway would be sort of a run of river facility. Then, uh, if demand continued to materialize and transmission lines could be constructed, there would be uh, another phase of that, which would tear out the spillway and raise the dam head to the full 205 meters. Um, so that would be sort of phases A through C. Uh, the, the people who write the feasibility studies say, you know, forget A and B, just do C, do the whole big dam, and um, uh, you'll, you'll be saving money if you do it that way. And then phases D through G are four run of river structures, each adding about 7,400 7, megawatts, at, and each facility would be about $4.5 billion. So these would come off of, hopefully you can see that, but um, up here is the big reservoir that would be created behind the dam. This would be the initial spillway that's the uh, 205, well, at 150 meters, the spillway would be over here, I guess. Um, that's Inga 8, so that's not right. The spillway would be right over here somewhere if they did the first one. Then they would build a full dam to cover that section and then put in the final, uh, the final spillways. The latest thing I saw was that they would have four of these. So that would be four, five, six, and seven. So if they're numbered based on what order they're planning on building in? Yeah. Yeah. So this, this they call Inga 3 here. Um, but it, and it's because Inga's one and two are those small dams that are already built. Uh, so this is Inga three. And then and then the whole facility they refer to a lot of times as Grand Inga. So Ignacio, this is um, this is the these were the cost, this was the cost breakdown for these transmission highways that they uh, have in a feasibility report. Um, I'll show you the lines first, and then we'll go back to that. So there's four there's four transmission lines, um, five if you if you break this the southern one up. Uh, so the southern one to deliver power down to South Africa had, comes with sort of two options. One can run this way on the western corridor. The other one could go down and deliver power down here to the mining community, and then continue down into South Africa. Um, there's another one that's the West Africa, brings it up to the West Africa power pool, uh, right up this way, and then this one here goes all the way up to Cairo. Yeah, yeah, that's a lot of transmission. Um, what about local demand? There, there's not. Yeah, there's not a lot. There's not a lot. I mean, even you know, even and Amy could speak to this better than I could. But even in in uh, East Africa, West Africa, there's not a lot of demand. I mean, the demand is really South Africa. Um, so those so those transmission lines make sense. Um, I won't go through all these different numbers, but you can see that up there, the the Wanda line is just a very short line. Um, the uh, western and eastern option for South, of South Africa, and then the western highway, the northern highway that goes all the way up to Cairo, um, are estimates for, uh, for the transmission construction. So obviously transmission is a huge deal, demand is a big deal, um, bringing the power to a, you know, to a particular demand location, and so while, while a lot of people had talked about the, you know, the, the relative value of 
this whole big giant dam that they were initially discussing, one of the big problems is who's going to buy it? Who's going to buy all that electricity? And so this idea of a scaled option or a phased option uh, that they've just sort of been developing over the past maybe five years has seemed to make a lot more sense. Well, are, are there a lot of communities that would be displaced by the development of the dam? You know, that's the, that's the thing about Inga, not a lot. Some, but not a lot. Um, for three gorges, it was like an absurd yeah. big number of people. What's that? It said for three gorges, it was like an absurd number of people. Right, right, it was a huge amount. Inga is a little more isolated. Okay. Um, but there, I mean, there would be there there would be some there would certainly be some displacement. Um, the reservoir that it creates, I think, is uh, I can't remember it off the top of my head, but um, I want to say a hundred thousand acres, maybe a hundred twenty thousand acres. Um, and uh, you know, obviously, it's pretty deep uh, with, at 200, 205 meters, at least down at the at the dam site. But um, yeah, it's a it's a great question. Uh, one that if they get past this feasibility stage, you know, obviously they'll start investigating that aspect. Okay, but it's not and, it's not considered to be a major barrier or anything. I don't think that's a. I don't think that's a major barrier. I think the big barriers are financing, um, and the political situation. Just a lot of political risk. Right. And you know, the, 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 but the environmental stuff, the, the uh, sociological stuff, they really haven't. I don't think they've dealt into that much. So just a couple thoughts in, in conclusion. Um, the Inga project would require massive commitment on, on both political and financial fronts, which uh, we just mentioned. Um, however, the new design fosters smaller projects and delays additional investment based on realized demand. So they could, you know, they could sell the initial 4,500 megawatts um, probably relatively easily and then see if other demand materializes, both domestically and internationally. Um, and then something I mentioned in the very beginning, just this idea of real options analysis can help to quantify the value of those flexibility choices. So that's kind of what I'm, I'm working on with Hank. What, what, can you explain the scaled options? Uh, you mentioned it briefly. So, yeah, I should say phased options. Phased options. Yeah, which basically goes back to those phases in Oh, I see. The so design. as they come online, be able to guarantee that the electricity that they can be sold. Yeah, basically. So, so if investors come into a project, right. uh, you know, they can they can they could gain by writing the contract okay. that they could also invest in the next phase if if and when you know that market demand materializes. Okay. But it's how are they try how are they trying to guarantee that demand? <clears throat> Is it through indu large industrial customers? Or like how does that work? Yeah, I think on the on the front, well, I think there's two parts of that. Part of it would be industrial customers. The other part would just be you know, as residents hook up to the grid all over. So as different power pools increase their demand, and as, as the DRC increases its demand. Um, so I think they're counting on Africans connecting to the grid and, and some, you know, who's off-grid systems bringing, you know, coming online, stuff like that. So so part of it's industrial, and then part of it's just sort of ground level. Hasn't ESCOM already signed some PPAs to try I don't, buy they've signed MOUs. Oh, I see. I don't know for sure if they've signed PPAs. Um, just Probably because. Yeah, just because the project is, is, you know, I mean, it's still in the, really the feasibility study, to my knowledge, is the last serious uh, document that's been produced on it. Yeah? Um, maybe in light of that, this is sort of also a premature question, but what are the funding pitfalls for those transmission lines, right? Like if, 
you know, if you have this big line that's going through like three different countries to get down to South Africa, if most, presumably most of the power goes to South Africa, but if it delivers some along the way, are there kind of complications in terms of who has to pay for how much of that? Yes. <laughs> yeah, there's a whole class about uh, how to pay for transmission and lines and all that. It's not just about that. But uh, um, yeah, Ignacio, do you want to address that a little bit? I took the class and, and I'm, I'm deferring to uh, Well, this is in part what Amy is doing for her thesis. So maybe you could talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's the way it should be done, and there's what's actually happening. What's actually happening is you have the World Bank saying, we'll give the DRC, their government, money for the, their side of the line. And then other countries are, like a mining company is building part of the line in their country. And so each kind of, within each country, they're kind of ad hoc coming up with who's going to fund different segments of it. Um, the utility in South Africa is called ESCOM, and they're trying to give a lot of people money to make sure that they get the power at the end of the line. Um, so how should it be? <laughs> um, according to who's benefiting from, from the line, which is not easy to calculate. Um, yeah, it's an internal discussion in transmission. Mm -hmm. So everywhere where you have uh, lines that are connecting, so for instance, Tonight we are going to uh, Iceland, Pablo and I, and they are talking about building a cable more than 1,000 kilometers between Ireland, Iceland and Scotland. Probably a big issue there where who is going to pay for that because mm -hmm. both countries benefit. And then uh, the, the, the theory says that allocation to beneficiaries is the right way to do that because this is how you make a project to be viable because if you I don't know, charge 50-50, but one is benefiting like 75 and the other 25, then the one benefiting like 25 has to pay for the half of the cost of the line. Maybe he will refuse to pay for that and then the line will not be built. So it is always that problem. Then the, the lines, you were saying, cross a country and maybe the country is going to benefit because there is nothing that... And it's the same thing that happens here. I mean, some, you take the wind in the center of the country, you want to bring that to the East Coast and then, okay, that will be cheap energy, but uh, crosses states that will not benefit for that, and then you know, they oppose to the line, then the people, uh, okay, so uh, always people who win and lose. So the, the uh, consumers at the end will benefit, but the generators at the end will lose because the, the power will be cheaper and then they will oppose. So it is a very heavy uh, problem always. What's the course number that you teach? <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember, but uh, ask six, these six, people five, because half of them have taken nice. the course. I'll check it out. Yeah. I, I also am not quite sure if the MOU that ESCOM has, has uh, signed with the government of DRC, if that includes payment for initial transmission, or if it's just an offtake, if, if it's just a power offtake. I mean, they're, they're very interested in getting the power, so I wouldn't be surprised if they're, you know, trying to figure out a way to pay for those transmission lines. Um, because their interest is high, there's a lot of political will, obviously, to bring stable electricity supply to that country. Um, so I'm sure they're very interested in, you know, sort of paying their fair share. Does the feasibility study address um, the likelihood of failure or likelihood of cost overruns, especially it's a huge project, and there's seemingly historical very little confidence of <coughs> success, or at least success on the timeline that they're, that they're advertising? Yeah, the feasibility study um, doesn't cover a lot of the risk, um, unless it's parts that I didn't bother to translate uh, from French. Um, but you're right about the huge cost overruns. There's an interesting study uh, by a guy named Amsar out of Oxford that just came out about a year and a half ago or so, if you're interested in this, about cost overruns, uh, especially with hydropower projects. And the bigger the, the bigger the project, the bigger the cost overruns, and you know, typically, and the bigger um, uh, the delays are, the time delays. 
and so that's a it's a huge it's a huge risk. And that's because that has a huge impact on the financing aspect in terms of when they actually start paying these loans down. Is World Bank funded? I uh, well, nothing's been developed, nothing, no financing plan has really been developed for Inga 3 and Grand Inga. The World Bank is financing the cleanup and refurbishment of those first two, of, of those first two sites. And yeah, it has a huge impact on the financing, which is, that's what I'm working on is, you know, when you plug in uh, those standard deviations into, you know, the variability of these cost overruns, into like an options pricing model or something like that, you know, you get very high values for, uh, for options. Um, which, you know, I mean, makes the project kind of interesting. Uh, these hydropower projects in Africa are kind of interesting because that's one of the things that sort of drives the volatility. Could you? No, sorry, I thought there was another hand. Go ahead, Ignacio. Could you explain a little bit about these real options? methodology what you are doing here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, as best I can. Uh, because I mean we were discussing Pablo and I yesterday about uh, these ideas applied to this cable uh, between Iceland and Scotland saying maybe it's wise given that there is a lot of uncertainty in the regulation in Europe regarding these issues and what, what the UK <coughs> is going to do with um, uh, treatment regulatory treatment of interconnectors to wait for a few years and then uh, uh, reinforce the Icelandic network that is kind of weak, and mm -hmm. then later you could do the thing, and then so the value of weight, right? mm -hmm. which I think is what mm -hmm. we're studying there. Yeah, yeah. So it's a, it's a value. So so an option, if you think of a financial option or you know a, a, a call option on a stock, um, if you buy that option, you bought the right, but not the obligation to purchase that stock at a specific point in the future. Um, if it's a what's called a European call option. So, so a real option structured the same way would be similar to what Ignacio just described. It would be the right but not the obligation to invest in or to, you know, to, to build the transmission line or a certain aspect of it at a certain point in time once more information about the markets, demand, um, you know, something else. What I'm doing is climate change, you know, for river flow, so that's sort of the variability. Um, but that's, that's essentially what a real option is. So rather than a stock option where you're talking about a financial project, a product, uh, a real option has to do with a physical, um, you know, a physical thing or a physical project that's, that's being constructed. There's two difficulties um, in, in valuing those things. One is sort of the technical side of how you calculate it, which ends up being the easier of the two. The other is, how you frame it, like what, what do you have once you have an option value? Why is it valuable? And really it's valuable as a decision making tool. So you could, in, in this case that Ignacio just described, you could, you could, you could derive an option value for waiting uh, on a certain part of the project versus an option for waiting on a different part of the project and then you can compare the two dollar figures to see which one gives you the greatest value. So you're taking otherwise sort of abstract decisions and you're assigning dollar value so that you can compare them directly. That's what a real option is, valuation does. Can you comment on the, the current work that's happening? How much of that is is basically outsiders coming in and, and doing the work versus is there a local experience developmental effort happening so that we have hydro our construction capacity. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. So, you know, the, the the demand centers are outside the country. So, the you, you know there, there's a lot of there's a lot of discussion uh, as to whether or not these you know would just be sort of a powerhouse, a big transmission line that you know sort of skies over all these unconnected communities and then lands again down in South Africa someplace. And there's there's some concern about that. Um, the the what DRC, I was getting at is you yourself said there's there's hundred gigawatts of potential capacity in the entire country. Yeah. It strikes me that these early refurbishment efforts and the Inga's you know, next, beyond next and beyond next 
are exactly what's needed to give this population the capacity to exploit the other 60 gigawatts beyond Ada. Yeah, yeah, certainly. So never mind that, that who, who buys. I mean, surely there's, there ought to be local capacity to actually exploit this. Well, there, I mean, there is, but, but I, I think the distribution and transmission capacity within, you know, locally is pretty meager. I don't think there's a lot of uh, just capacity to deliver to communities. You know, they, they could build more to make the other sites more viable, probably, um, and I'm sure that they would. Um, but the infrastructure inside the DRC, I think, is pretty weak. So, so, so part of you know part of this, uh, uh, there's there's concern on behalf of. NGOs and, and others and communities, you know, within especially the DRC, but other neighboring countries. Um, if if we take on we as a country take on huge loans to build a project like this, are we going to get the capacity developed so that we can plug into the grid as well? Is that going to be something for us? Um, and so the, you know, the, those are the negotiations that those communities have with their government, and the government says yes, of course, you know, we're going to. We're going to do that. We won't just sell to the highest bidder. And, um, yeah. So the, the you know the first the first big project went to Kinshasa, and uh, was is, is continues to be significant there. And so I, I imagine that there there's plenty to go around. It would just be a matter of building the infrastructure to do it. I saw a headline last week from. Um some minister in the DRC that they would start construction on Inga 3 by the end of next year. Oh, really? Yes. <laughs> um, is he dreaming? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. By the end of 2016? Yeah. Um, I don't know. You know, I mean, it, it's, it, it certainly is possible with a price tag of around, depending on how you do it, between $6 billion and $12 billion. Um, that's not completely outside the realm of possibility. You know, then you add to that the, the transmission. Um, perhaps their ongoing, you know, perhaps their ongoing uh, dialogue with South Africa is such that they feel like maybe they're getting some of that transmission stuff paid for. Um, maybe the World Bank is stepping in with, uh, you know, with some with some loan money and stuff like that. But yeah, it, it could certainly it certainly could be. Is the is the, the lower river run here um, above this Inga site such that much smaller projects, you know, order tens to hundreds of megawatts, could be done slightly upriver? So once again, sort of chiseling away at the larger problem, building up local capacity, building up local demand. Yeah, I think a lot of the a lot of the site is, or I mean, a lot of the hydropower potential. I don't know this very well, so so if somebody has a different idea, please chime in. But it's my understanding that a lot of the available capacity is further up the river, um, and it's in a fairly dangerous, you know, politically, and uh, there, there's a lot of strife in that area by Rwanda and, and these areas. But that a lot of the capacity is up farther not immediately above the Inga site. Now, you could, that, that Inga site, the water falls, uh, I thought I had it in here, and I, I don't, it was probably, it's in my paper somewhere, but the water falls a long ways. Um, whether the same thing happens, you know, just upriver of this, I, I don't think so, but I'm not entirely sure. Could you touch on the environmental opposition? with that and also uh, maybe a little bit more about the organization you can start in the states who are opposing dams being built altogether. Um, I think I heard somewhere that uh, it's that no one takes care of the dam after it's been built, maybe like 30, 40 years down the line. It's lost its functionality and it's this giant concrete structure that's getting in the way of the ecosystem and it actually is very costly to um, take down. So could you I don't know what your thoughts are on that. Yeah, so the, the, the environmental, and I, 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 again, there hasn't been a lot written yet about the environmental assessments for Inga. Um, but in general, yeah, demands are, or one of the things that happens, as you guys probably well know, is that sediment comes behind the, the, uh, the dam structure and starts to fill up 
your, your reservoir. And so pretty soon you're working where you were working, in this case with a head that is, you know, 205 meters high. Head and flow are what drive hydropower output. So once your head starts to shrink because of sediment buildup, build up, then all of a sudden your hydropower output is going down, and uh, you end up with a you know with a, a, a facility that's not producing as much power as it originally did. And that's part of the breakdown of it. Other things as well, you know, sort of cracks or you know whatever happens with the with the infrastructure. And so, so yeah, so there's a, there's, I mean, it's a legitimate question of how do you refurbish these things. One of the things they do is what the World Bank is doing with Ingus 1 and 2 is they dredge behind it. And so they actually pull out all that sediment and just clean it out so that the, you know, it brings that the, the standing water up higher again. Um, the other environmental complications are, you know, with, with like fish species. It, it tends to, uh, and other sediment problems on the, on the back side of the dam, so on the downriver side, because they push the water back through and it can gouge out the riverbed, pushing more sediment down toward the, you know, toward the other side of the dam. That displaces fish, can displace fish. Um, there's articles written about uh, the, since hydropower is sort of seen to be this green source of energy, um, one author uh, that I can't remember his name, but uh, he talks about the gases that are actually released once you flood a basin and then all the decomposition starts and those gases escape and those are harmful to the atmosphere. Uh, you know, and so they tend to offset whatever sort of green footprint that, that hydropower has. So those are some of the environmental issues that are behind you know, some of the opposition to big dams. Um, plus then there's displacing the communities like somebody mentioned before. So International Rivers uh, has, you know, sort of taken up those causes and, and says, that, you know, dams aren't worth it. There's other ways to get power. Um, and so they, they lobby, they're very active in Africa, very active in the US, and uh, have a pretty extensive website that you can go on and read about different projects that are being proposed, and they'll talk about different problems that are, you know, built into those projects. And so, what, what do you think the Inca uh, project has, is a rebuttal to all of the, these quest, like, concerns? Yeah, the, well, the Inca project, I mean, on the people displacement side, um, it doesn't seem like it's, it would be hugely impactful um, for that. The, the reservoir that it's going to create is big, but it's not enormous for the, for the amount of power that it's generating. Um, the downstream, you know, sediment issues would probably be significant because there's a, there's a you know, you're, you're, you're flushing a lot of water down some narrower channels that are going to cause you know, a lot of sediment to be kicked up and then sort of redistributed someplace else. So that would be, a, I think that would be a pretty significant problem. Well, a lot of those things can be dealt with with maintenance, not all of them, and not, not all really well. Um, you know, part of the rebuttal is just that Inga would generate so much revenue that you would be able to maintain all of those aspects. Um, at least that's what advocates say. Uh, whether or not that's true, I don't know. Everybody curious about the Congo should read the latest National Geographic just for a populist perspective on this, because it, it surveys the state of affairs of, of the, the state-run ferrying infrastructure upriver, essentially above the, the above falls, the site, yeah, and how just disastrous that country has been in their capacity to run things without corruption and incompetence. Mm -hmm. So I mean, you know, we're, we're talking about expecting a hell of a lot from a country that's barely functioning. Yeah. Uh, uh, civil, you know, infrastructure-wise. Well, and, and I mean, another illustration of that is how all the, you know, how the other sites have been handled. Um, they've fallen into disrepair, they've, mm -hmm. you know, the, the transmission lines have fallen apart, and uh, huge, huge cost overruns on things that shouldn't have been so expensive. 
So that, that's a great point. Any other questions? I'm sure if you have, do you have a couple minutes to stick around? Sure. Yeah. Well, let's be rich. Thank you.